This oral history of museum computing is provided by Lori Bird McDevitt and was recorded on the 7th of May, 2021 by Paul Marty and Kathy Jones. Um, I spent about 10 years, I, I say nine-ish or about 10 years at the Children's Museum of Indianapolis um, as their social media manager um, primarily. Um, and so, and I left that role about two years ago. Um, and so I kind of have two identities that people know me for. <laughs> there was that, the social media role. Um, but before that, um, I had become accidentally nerd famous, as I like to say, um, by being their Wikipedian in residence. Um, and so that um, was around 2010 um, and to 2012. Um, I didn't become their social media manager until 2012. Um, and so, Nowadays, I feel like people tend to know the term Wikipedian in residence. I feel like it's a little bit more um, of a phrase you hear, at least in our circles in the, in the cultural sector. Um, I don't even know how many there are <laughs> in the world. Um, but at the time, I was the first Wikipedian in residence in the United States um, and the first um, female Wikipedian in residence in the world. Um, so that was a pretty big deal. Um, and what's interesting also a fun fact about me is that I married another Wikipedian in residence, <laughs> Dominic Bird McDevitt. <laughs> so he was the National Archives, um, United States National Archives Wikipedian in residence. Um, and we always like to joke that, you know, I kind of beat him to it with the superlative there because he was just right behind me by a couple months and becoming their Wikipedian in residence. But um, so that was all about 2010-ish. Um, that all of that was happening. And um, there were only a few of us that were kind of gathering together around this, this premise in 2009-ish, going into 2010, um, around this idea that, you know, Wikipedians are very prickly. You know, it's not easy to contribute content to Wikipedia, to edit Wikipedia at the time, especially way back, way back then. Um, and so, um, you know, there were those of us that were involved in museums that really wanted to see museums be able to contribute content to Wikipedia and more easily. And um, I got involved in that because I was in the IUPUI Museum Studies Program. So that's Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis. Um, and I met um, a man named Richard McCoy and he was the conservator at the Indianapolis Museum of Art and happened to be the adjunct professor along with Jennifer Mikulay, um at um, IEPY for their collections management course in the graduate school um, there in the master's program um, for museum studies. Um, at the time, I just was a stay-at-home mom um, to my little guy. He was like eight months old or something. I don't even remember how old my, my little guy Teddy was. And I just was um, planning to be a stay-at-home mom. Maybe I think I was going to get a certificate in museum studies. Um, I was going to be thrilled to go hide away in a collections, you know, some um, lower level collection storage somewhere and organize for the rest of my life. I was going to be happy as a clam to do that. Um, I was going to be a history teacher. Um, and I had lived in Virginia and my husband, um, my ex-husband now, my husband at the time, um, we had moved to Indianapolis and I'd had the opportunity to switch careers and had my baby and was like, Meh, let's try museums. Let's go do collections instead. Um, but Richard was like, he and Jenny, they met me in this class and they were like, Lori, you, you can, you're legit. Like you are a smart cookie. Why are you just getting a certificate? You should be in the full program. And, um, you know, you're really smart in this class and we were doing work with Wikipedia. We just, for whatever reason, they were really, they had had this idea of, can Wikipedia be a, um, a collections management system? Can it be a CMS? Um, it was just a question. We ended up being like, no, not really. Um, but the class decided that um, because of how the community norms are. You know, you can't just go in and you have to have a, um, you know, you have to have citations, you have to have other sources, you can't go in and just say, I with my eyeballs 
see that this public artwork, you know, is deteriorating. You can't do that in Wikipedia. So it can't be a CMS. Um, but, you know, we realized I became very passionate. Um, one of the main people in the class that became the most passionate about, you know, Wikipedia is this historical record, you know, I, as a historian, I just was like, you know, this isn't just some online encyclopedia. This is um, an editable resource that over time is being updated by so many people. Um, and, you know, I realized, I always say this word wrong, but essentially Wikipedia is a palimpsest, right? So it's layers and layers of, of everyone's interpretation of history over time. And I really loved that because um, as a history student, I was always concerned about, you know, what's gonna happen? Like we don't have diaries, we don't have journals, we don't have the, the physical photos anymore. Like, you know, the 19th and 20th century, uh, you know, in the past, everything's digital and that really bothered me. But I really liked that Wikipedia had the version histories and you could really look back and watch how everything changed. So I just became obsessed with the premise of Wikipedia because of this class. Um, and then therefore how museums could contribute to it also. It just was dumb luck that at the same time, a number of other Wikipedians happened to also be starting to chit chat about museums and their um, contributions to Wikipedia. And also dumb luck that Twitter also happened to be um, a thing <laughs> in 2008, 2009 or whatever, um, going into 2010. And so I found um, this gentleman who happened to be about my same age um, named Liam Wyatt. He was Australian um, and he was a longtime Wikipedian and was just out talking to everybody about how, you know, all of my fellow Wikipedians stop being so mean to newbies, stop biting the newbies. That's what they always say. Wikipedians don't bite the newbies. Um, we need to, you know, gather up, you know, we need to come up with policies or new processes to help curators, help museum people be able to contribute in new, new ways. So um, I just started talking to these people on Twitter and suddenly we were going to be meeting in real life at, in New York at this like event and they were going to fly me in like they came up with some grant through Wikipedia. I didn't even know that was a thing. And um, I was meeting these people I talked to on Twitter and I, again, became um, accidentally part of this thing this, um, that became Glam Wiki. Um, so, you know, through men my mentors, Richard and um, Jenny and meeting Liam and, a num and my future husband, Dominic, um, and a number of other Wikipedians, um, I kind of was thrown into this world. <laughs> Part of that too actually was um, was MCN. Um, it was around that year, it was Austin. I think that was 2010. Um, you guys will just have to correct me. <laughs> See, you guys know what you're talking about. 2010 was Austin. Um, so it was all of that same time that we were figuring out all of this stuff with, with um, you know, open culture, sharing content on Wikipedia that um, Coven reached out to, of course, Coven Smith reached out to um, Richard McCoy and was like, um, I'd love your help on a panel down here um, at MCN. And um, it's about open content. I hear you're doing stuff about that. And Richard said, I'll come and I'll help you out, but only if you let um, this random grad student, Lori, come with me and speak. And I was like, don't make me go speak. I don't want to speak. <laughs> I, I'm just some stay-at-home mom. And Richard dragged me along to Austin and to this whole conference that I didn't know what it was. And I found my people. It was, it was MCN and I'd found my people. And it was a whole bunch of other nerds that were just so nice and so welcoming. And they just happened to be from the Met and you know all these places in the Smithsonian. And, um, but they were not intimidating. Um, and it was amazing. Um, and one of my first, that first presentation was um, sitting right along next to Corey Timpson, um, who was sharing about um, um, his um, museum up in Canada of, um, you know, the, of human rights, the Canadian Museum of Human Rights, or I might be getting that name wrong, but, <laughs> um, and it's just watching us all grow together from that moment. Um, it's, it's been really amazing. Um, 
And so that was really the catalyst for a lot of things. Again, just kind of accidentally becoming nerd famous in that way. Um, I never wanted to be out doing public speaking, um, but I just happened to be one of the first people doing Glam Wiki, literally branding Glam Wiki. Um, you know, this galleries, libraries, archives, and museums contributing to Wikipedia, coming up with, um, and that first I mentioned before, that first event um, um, up in New York that they flew us into, um, we were coming up with the very first um, kind of, um, you know, main um, kind of, again, like branding around what GlamWiki is and policies and procedures around what we really, the, the values and mission around what we wanted um, the, this little mini community to be. Um, and I'm really proud of being able to contribute to that. Um, and it's really just grown and grown and grown from there. And um, a lot of these like little logos that were so silly at the time, they're still like floating around out there and used. Um, and so from there, you know, we've, we've developed a lot of these, um, piloted a lot of projects um, to do um, like edit-a-thons, um, which now everyone's heard of edit-a-thons in the cultural sector of, you know, going into museums and training up curators and, and the public and volunteers to use those resources that are on site in museums or libraries or archives. And, um, you know, together bringing Wikipedians and the experts and contributing directly into articles. And then from there, even getting more involved and creating themes around them and, you know, um, and that then dovetailed into um, the gender gap in Wikipedia and Wiki, Wiki women, um, considering the fact that museums have so many more um, women in them than men. And how can Glam Wiki contribute to the gender gap and help with the help with the gender gap? Um, it was really um, amazing to be able to build and build and build on that through the years. Um, and so it was about two years later after all this kind of got started that um, and piloting these projects. Um, and again, I was more on the outreach side. I wasn't necessarily the ones like building the bots and doing like the data um, stuff. I was more the person that was, you know, doing the, the people work, um, making Wikipedia nicer <laughs> for the people um, and doing the messaging work, um, which was a lot of the, the more, the, the important stuff in the early days. So um, the, I did a lot of um, working with Wikipedia, the Wikimedia Foundation to travel around and do speaking, which again, I never wanted to be the one doing that. Um, I um, um, actually ended up um, asking them or applying to try to be um, a US cultural partnerships coordinator. So um, getting a role, a, a paid role with the Wikimedia Foundation. And so that was a one year position. Um, I developed the, the role myself, I pitched it to them I was told no by two different departments, and um, I ended up being picked up by um, the third person that looked at the the pitch, <laughs> and it was the um, uh, man who runs the the Global South initiatives, which I'm not Global South, you know, that's <laughs> not at all. Um, but his name is Asaf Bartov, and he he really believed in in the glam. Um, project and he really believed in me and my gumption around it all and so he was my supervisor for that year and I just remember not believing at all that it, this had all happened that it had come true that I went from being a volunteer in Wikipedia to really believing so much in this community of glam wiki that I was able to pitch a full paid role with the actual Wikimedia Foundation and after being told no by a couple of people, because it's hard to get a role in Wikimedia, that I was actually able to, I was after like a week, flown out to San Francisco, I had never been to San Francisco before. I'm like by myself, like pulling my little bag through the streets of San Francisco to the Wikimedia Foundation offices, you know, getting my picture taken by a little globe that everyone, you know, sees and sitting in the office, a soft office. And um, just like they do, I mean, what, how they use 
a lot of the donor funds in addition to keeping the servers running, which is the main most important thing. And then they don't have many staff, but what they use the money for is um, it's really important to them to um, bring people together IRL in real life. They want the community to gather and keep the work going. Um, the community is so important. So being a, a community coordinator, flying me all over the world to spread the pilot projects to like distribute the pilot projects around and train other people up on what to do was really important to them. So here I was, um, you know, sitting in a soft's office and he's like, okay, tell me all these conferences, you know, about all these museum conferences that you need to go off and train people. He's like, yep, going to that one. Yep, going to that one. Yep, going to that one. And I just was like, what is happening in my life? Um, and so that it was just so surreal to me. Um, I had to go in like a not from in one to two years from never do not ever make me stand up in front of anyone to talk to. Well, if I want to go to Barcelona tomorrow, I'm going to have to be, you know, terrified for five minutes and go talk in front of people to, about Wikipedia. Um, but I learned real quick. Um, and yes, this was a big change from being a stay at home mom really quickly. Um, and, you know, I was surrounded by a lot of people that really were, were eager to learn. And, um, I was surrounded by a lot of friends, you know, a lot of the Wikipedia community, even though it's prickly, <laughs> once you're in it, they're very supportive. And it was, it was a huge family to be able to fly from country to country and to meet so many people I'd, you know, really had, you know, become family to me and be able to meet them and tour these countries that similarly to the museum tech world, when you get to travel to different cities, it's so much different and more fun when you are visiting someone you know in a new place, right? Rather than just going on a trip um, somewhere where you don't know anyone. <laughs> um, so um, my husband, Dominic and I, we always say how we feel so lucky that we can go pretty much anywhere in the world and, and know someone, have a friend we could at least visit with or stay with or be able to go have a meal and know it's the best restaurant in town. <laughs> so um, I'm really lucky that I have two big, you know, like kind of work fams or big, you know, communities and that's the Wikipedia community and also the, the Muse tech community. Both are equally important to me. And, um, so while that all happened and I had my one year um, with GlamWiki and um, the, the outreach side really took off and um, we realized we really had to clone ourselves. We, we all couldn't do everything. It was gonna keep growing and growing. Um, and once, once people started learning on their own um, and we did that through a thing called Glam Bootcamp. Um, and so um, Dominic and I actually were the, the ones to develop this curriculum for Glam Bootcamp. And, and this was um, basically training up new um, Wikipedians to be Glam people, because we realized that so many people were looking to us to continue the lead. Um, and that just couldn't be, the, be what happened. Um, so we did this in, actually at the National Archives. We, we realized that what's really important is an invitation culture is you know people won't necessarily step up and say, "Well, I'm the best one for this." You know, people people need you to, um, you know, say, "I think you're going to be awesome at this." You know, I, I see potential in you, just like my mentor did for me. I would never have stepped up. <laughs> so passing that along, you know, like inviting someone up to to take that leadership role to pass the baton along. So we I forget how many people were at that first boot camp. Um, but um, we actually had Mike Edson come and speak to them um, about the importance of, you know, open in general and just, you know, how important the like museum um, professionals needed to hear from Wikipedians. And you got, you know, how Mike Edson's just, you know, amazingly bombastic and, you know, will inspire anyone to do anything. <laughs> I, I think. Um, between him and the actual archivist of the United States stopping by to say hi. Um, it was just a really inspiring weekend where we trained them up on, on different um, processes and outreach and um, really empowered them to all go back all over the world actually and America 
Um, this was all paid for by Wikimedia. Again, we just got grants and flew them in free of charge. And um, they all went back and became Wikipedians in residence or did their own you know, events all over America and different places. One of the girls, um, Emily Temple Wood, she's based out of Chicago. She um, ended up just becoming such the long tail, you know, the premise of the long tail of, you know, one person goes and this does so much, you know, and kind of that volunteer culture that she, um, a couple of years later, became um, Wikipedian of the year, which is a huge distinction in the community. I mean, there's, I can't even tell you how many Wikipedians there are. And then at Wikimania, which is the big conference every year, which is global, they give this honor. Um, and it's a really big honor. I mean, one year they gave it to um, a Wikipedian who's a journalist who passed away because of, you know, the rights of Wikipedians, um, it was the European. I mean, so it's, it's a big deal. <laughs> and so the fact that someone we, you know, picked as someone we saw as having such potential kind of like plucked out of nowhere, came and trained up and that she just went off and was so empowered and just was so amazing in her honor of her own accord and went above and beyond and then to become um, Wikipedian of the years. It's always been really important to Dominic and I. Um, so that just kind of shows, it's, it's all kind of gone off on its own and it got to the point where, you know, now things are to the point where it's like about metadata, metadata it's Wikidata. It's all about, you know, connecting all the APIs and getting the content here and there. It's not about, you know, convincing people to use Wikipedia anymore. Definitely it is to a degree. There's definitely people that, you know, need to be convinced about open. But back when we were starting, there wasn't the Wikipedia card up on Google, right? It wasn't that Wikipedia was incorporated into every little thing. And it was like, you go there for the facts. It was still that you had to tell people the, the very basics of how it worked. And that, you know, if there's a little star up there, that's a featured article. And that means that it's been, <laughs> you know, vetted a billion times over. Um, and so now it's a different conversation. Now it's much more technical. Now it's all about connecting the information across so many things. So, you know, my needs for my skill set have moved on into social media. Um, my husband, he's always been on the technical side and, and, and outreach side. Um, he worked for the National Archives many years beyond that. He now works for the Digital Public Library of America. Um, and he has been doing stuff with APIs and databases and a um, lot of great work. Um, I just have more broadly shifted to um, online communities in general um, and still love all of my Wikipedia family, but they just don't need me in that way anymore. <laughs> um, so in 2012 is when I got my role actually as social media manager at the Children's Museum. Um, and it was Montreal MCN, was that 2014? Um, so a few years into that, that, um, you know, we started realizing that um, like all the social media managers we, we would get kind of frustrated with each other if like we stole an idea or like we, we were kind of like um, in competition with each other sometimes. And like, we just like, it, that was silly. Like, um, oh, 2013 was MC in Montreal. Okay. Um, so um, Montreal was where I first met um, Ryan Dodge. Um, who's formerly of um, Royal Ontario Museum and also Canadian War Museum. Um, and he and I now are just best of friends. Um, and um, it was at that um, conference that we were just chatting with a number of a few of us and we were like, why, why don't we have a space where we can be more, um, you know, supportive of one another, just more proactively supportive and have each other's backs, share resources, you know, just have fun, just, you know, like, it's so hard being a social media manager. Even back then it was hard and it's even gotten way harder. <laughs> um, so we started a Facebook group called um, Museum Social Media Managers. Um, and it 
that was 2013. And so it has grown and grown and grown and grown and grown and grown. And, grown. <laughs> um, and what's interesting is that I would say my identity was really tied to being like a Wikipedian and Wikipedian in residence, definitely back in the day. Nowadays, I would say people, when they meet me, they say, you're the admin of the Facebook group of the Muse Social Facebook group. I'm just, thank you so much for creating that. Like, and it's, I'm so proud of that. I would, I'm, I'm proud of both, but I, um, I, <laughs> um, it's interesting how that's shifted. Um, I also am definitely grateful and appreciative that I'm known for, um, being um, the social media, the face behind the Children's Museum social media accounts. Um, I was able to do so many projects through that, um, but that's a whole other um, oral history project. Um, but the, the Facebook group is at 7,000 members now. Um, and it, even a year ago, it was only at 4,000 members. So it's just exponentially growing promise I, I'm the one that um, accepts the members in still um, I do have moderators that help me but um, that's my, one of my primary jobs and I promise I vet them I mean I'm really do check in on who these people are and those are all legitimate members um, but there just are so many of us I mean if you think of you know all of the museums of the world and then it's it's anyone who is a social media manager but then also could be on a communications team you have to think of in museums I mean staff wear so many hats. So it could be, you know, a director of a historic house. Um, it's also um, could be communicate um, different museum studies students, you know, that are interested in this um, and just want to learn. Um, I'm, I'm obviously never going to turn that down. Um, and then, you know, otherwise, I'm pretty protective of it if if they don't share um, a good reason for being there <laughs> other than those main reasons. Um, it's definitely a safe space. Um, but one of the reasons, the things I'm very, um, I'm shifting to this kind of online community to, to talk about, um, it's definitely, I feel like, become a pretty important piece of the, the history of um, museum tech is, um, you know, it's, it really has become a place where we've collaborated um, and actually really made an impact, um, which I don't know that I would have expected that so much, um, but we've been able to with people like Mar Dixon and a number of other people. I mean, anyone can do it. Um, Emily Haidt and many others. Um, we've created a, many countless social media campaigns across museums, um, nationally, internationally, theme-based, you know, organization-based. Um, one of the ones I like to share about all the time is um, hashtag day of facts. Um, and this one came out of, you know, w one of the many Trumpian things, you know, Trump lies about things um, back at whatever year it was. I mean, now they all blend together. Um, and um, so, you know, this was based on the premise of just simply museums sharing facts um, in combating Trump lies. Um, and it was really powerful um, and it made, you know, national news. Um, it was clearly very US centric, so it wasn't international, but, um, and I don't even know all of the stats around it. Um, actually one of my agency team members, Ali um, Hartley Kong actually was one of the organizers of it. Um, but I'm, I'm so proud of, of campaigns like that, that had true, true impact and were organized in our group um, and, and just to then fund things like just in the moment, because we have a group like that massive, um, you know, blizzards, you know, hit um, like huge swaths of the country or the continent. And then we can say, Hey, you guys want to have a museum snowball fight? Hashtag museum snowball fight. And then we do. And then it like gets on, you know, um, tech crunch and, you know, major tech magazines and things, um, because, oh, all the museums are having a snowball fight that's worth covering, you know, because we have that type of, you know, impact. Um, and then of course, fun things like the superb owl, you know, to hack Super Bowl, of course, classic things like that. So, you know, <laughs> it's fun because it's to the point where there's people that have said, is there a secret society of like social media managers and museums somewhere that are organizing these things? And we're just like, 
we've won, <laughs> we've won the internet. Uh, <laughs> um, so, you know, that's that's the, the best side, but then there's also just the fact that we can support each other when we're having bad days, we can go straight there. You know, when when we see that like, someone at the na the social media manager at the National Park Service has gotten fired because they've done something, we can go there and say, hey, are you here? Are you okay? You know, and like, it's, they are, like they're there and we can support them, you know, crazy things like that. So um, I've been really proud that that community has thrived and stayed how it is when so many online communities, especially through the different political, you know, environments we've had to push through, you know, have torn apart online communities so much. Um, that I've been really proud of that, um, that Ryan and I were able to build that and, and our admins since. Um, and so basically through that, um, you know, I always tell people with different advice of, you know, it's, it's not necessarily about you know, when it comes to kind of like your online personal brand, like it's not about promoting you and yourself. It's about, you know, sharing others. It's about standing on the shoulders of giants. That's what I, I always say that. And our community in Muse Tech and MCN in particular, but Muse Tech in general has been so supportive and just gathers themselves around us. Like we, we just don't let anyone fall. Um, and I've seen that over and over again. Um, and it's just, if, if we share each other, like then we just, we keep growing. Um, and that's just, that's served me well. And just like, I find such personal satisfaction in, in helping support my friends and colleagues in the community. And it's just happened to come back around to me when I haven't even asked for it. Um, so that's just been really meaningful for me. I love the positive angle that you have on this. I mean, it's it's really refreshing and, and reassuring. And I just love the story of Social media managers using social media to coordinate social media activities. I know. <laughs> it's very, it's very meta. No, but it's great because how else do you coordinate those things, right? <laughs> Which gets to what I love most, and that's the community aspect of what you do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really great. <laughs> I was taking some notes as you were talking. Also, uh, some some recurring themes that we that we have heard a lot. Um, I, I love the way you talked about how well, Wikipedia was no longer about convincing people to use Wikipedia, but helping people connect information across domains. Yep. Right? This is something that I think has happened so many times in the history of museum computing. We first had to convince people to do it. Now everybody's right. on board. Now we have to get everybody working together. Yeah, it's very true. Yep. And I think you have you have the same kind of parallel with uh, social media, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I I feel like a lot of times people um, it's about convincing them first um, to get on board with social media, and then they think that they can do it themselves, and then <laughs> and then it's about saying, well, no, <laughs> um, let me take you that extra click deeper and share that bit of expertise with you about how that can be strategic and how we can apply that to our museum. And, you know, you can do that on your personal channels, um, but let's stick to the, the professional side of things over here, so. That, that's an interesting comment about being strategic with social media, right? Because looking at the, like, as you said, you, you got into this right when Twitter was taking off, right? When, right when all these things were starting and, um, I'd be curious to know your thoughts about how museums have evolved those strategies really from nothing, right? To a, to a, to a good strategic plan for outreach online. Yeah, absolutely. So many of us all say that we feel like we grew up on social media together and that, you know, it's evolved so much. Um, and 
it, it's kind of just like there's layers and layers and layers of it. And you've had to just kind of learn as you go and get more strategic as you go. Um, I feel like one element to this that's really important is that when it comes to social media in particular, that not every like human, like social media role has to be an expert at every aspect, like as it's kind of been globbed on. And I think that's a big thing with a lot of tech roles. Um, a big thing that I do currently and I'm really passionate about is burnout and mental health. Um, and that's across our whole field and with a lot of roles, but social media in particular, you know, you see these um, job descriptions that are just like, here, you can do all of these things and then five more. Um, and so, you know, where I kind of drew the line and I was lucky that I had um, a, a boss that was very um, thoughtful about this with me was, you know, it's okay that, you know, as for instance, um, I feel like Facebook might be a better example because Facebook changes literally every day. You never know what the heck's going on. Um, you know, I, I started to um, try to get into Facebook advertising, like the advertising side of things. That's fine. I was like on top of it for a bit. And then there came a point where I was like, you know what, this is a thing where someone needs to be an expert in it. And that's okay. I'm not going to do that. I am this side of things. You, we need to find someone to be an expert on this side of things. And you know, you need to be strategic in understanding that and using your resources to, you know, find those people that can have that depth of expertise in these different aspects of, of digital, but also understanding that social media is dividing up too. You can't just keep globbing on every single thing. Social media is changing so quickly. Um, and, you know, understanding the cultural sector, different places have few resources, but, you know, social media is also your front door. Um, and, you know, the first thing people see, so you, you need to be thoughtful about what that means for not making your one social media manager have to know everything <laughs> because they're going to get burnt out and then you're going to be up a creek without a paddle. So um, that was where I drew the line was Facebook social advertising. It's such a rabbit hole that, you know, I won't be able to do the online community building, the influencers, the crisis comms, all of this other stuff you need me to do if I have to also understand all of that. So. It's a good example on it. And certainly the connection to mental health is is exactly right as well. I mean, and again, I think it's a parallel with, with the history of museum computing that uh, almost in any, or maybe perhaps even in the whole field, there were museums where there was one person and now there's 200, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Was there any, were there any other examples or stories that you wanted to share? We have 10 minutes. Um, so, I mean, I think that one of the things that's kind of come more recently in regards to social media and tying it up with kind of mental health stuff is that, you know, I've just been really proud of how, um, when it comes to us supporting one another now, we've actually been really outspoken about social media and museums and mental health, like this kind of Venn diagram that's really dangerous. Um, and, you know, it's, we've been getting bolder and bolder in talking about the, the issues in toxicity, in hierarchy, in boards, in labor issues and unions, and, you know, just talking the, the tough, having the tough conversations around it. Um, and then where that's, that layers on expectations around, um, first off, kind of just even the, the mental gymnastics and the psychological games that come along with well, like unpaid internships, there's strides going along with that, uh, thankfully, but we got to keep moving on it um, with you're lucky to work here. You're, you're, it's the mission, you know, it's why would you ever leave, you know, um, it really being your identity that you're a museum person. I talk to people a lot about that right now because I'm, I've now left, um, officially left museums. I'm now in an agency, but I still support museums a lot, right? So I talk about that a lot with people of, it still can be your identity. Like, I still feel like I'm a museum person, but, you know, so um, there's a lot around that of, of feeling um, like you, 
are expected to stay because you've earned this and you should feel lucky. Um, so just having those tough conversations around that. And then once you're there, you know, everyone working 120%, 150% um, and doing five jobs instead of one. Um, and, you know, just what that means for burnout. Um, that's all just anybody's job. Add on to that social media, add on to that dealing with trolls, add on to that dealing with crisis communications. I mean, it, the social media manager is the one that when there's such the horrible things happening in the news, they're having to write the social posts or consider even if they should or not around all these things with with their museum um, and just dealing with mean people on the internet and the negativity that comes with life and they never get to turn off, it's 24 hours a day. Um, and that's just even dealing with the people. Then there's everything else <laughs> and every platform changing all the time. Um, I think in our social group, in our Muse social group, it's just probably the biggest thing is, please don't one more thing change. Like, please, <laughs> what is the thing today? What is a fleet? Oh my goodness. Like I haven't even started TikTok yet. What's going on? You know, like what it's, it's all of that. It's so much pressure. Um, and so one of the more recent changes, um, I, I keep using this example, but, um, this topic came up kind of as an aside, um, even at the most recent MCN, because um, it was just a recurring theme um, in the back channels. And it caused, I think, um, the social media manager and the team at the Field Museum to actually say, um, no, we're going to actually have a, a pause. We're going to have a public social media pause for a week. And we're going to publicly say, we're pausing. And it's not even for her to go on vacation or something. It was for her to be able to do her other work. It was for her to be able to strategize for the year. Like, imagine that. It wasn't even like for her to have a mental break. It was just for her to be able to organize her life for her work. But she put up on social, just we're chilling. Like, it's, we're chilling for a week, just pause. And that itself was huge. And that itself was a huge step to model for the rest of the field and to be able to take to the C-suites of other museums and say, look, the field did this. The field museum did this. So can we do this? And that was, I was really proud of that. Um, so hopefully now it can be that we can also go on vacations. <laughs> but um, yeah, I just wanted to kind of bring that full circle of um, you know more, more recent things going on. Um, I was really proud of. It's a good example, I think, also along this theme of invisible work and things that people don't realize. I, I suspect the the general public out there doesn't quite realize that that museums are working 24 <laughs> seven. Mm -hmm. Yep. The objects aren't suddenly just safe at night just because the lights go off. <laughs> I think that was interesting over COVID, um, interesting dialogue happening about the the value of like human life and going back in and like taking care of the museum and the objects and versus and also being there for reopening and people coming in versus like the value of the objects um it was really interesting conversations happening with that um i don't know if that's come up at all with any of your other conversations but it's more recent but really just stunning conversations and and um, trauma from people of like being feeling that they'll lose their jobs if they don't go in to work, um, especially with uh, what our community went through with all of the layoffs and furloughs. And it just, I think it brought us all together more, um, but it definitely, this has been a tough year for us and I'm, I'm glad we made it through, but it's been, it's been a tough one. <laughs>